my first words to him were, I've read your work. Yes, he, that's true. He was introduced to me by William F. Nolan, who had published several of Dennis's short stories at the very beginning of his, like, 20 years old kind of career. And Dennis and William was saying, and this is my friend Dennis Edison, click, click, Bill had talked about this. Click, click. I had read a couple of his shorts. And I had read The Four of Us Are Dying. I knew who you were. <laughs> and there was an instant bonding because he knew I wasn't lying. I had read his stuff. I had evaluated him and I had judged him good. That was a real comment. And he could feel all this coming from me as I clapped him on the back. And this was a meeting of the science fiction writers of America. It was in a restaurant on La Cienega, was it? Called the Nanki Poo. Yeah, the Nanki Poo. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Oh, I can see it now. That's great. In fact, I we're still there. I don't actually have the memory of the first time I met you. I, I just like we you were a little boy. You were, you were a little boy. This is my son, Paul. Who's known me almost as long as Dennis? Because he, when he was a little boy, Dennis would come to my house. I, but I want to. We instantly became companions along the way. We held book signings together. We performed our sister act, where every once in a while, when I'm at the heights of my euphoria over being in charge of things, he will come in and make a comment. So back and forth we come. I admired him. I think he's a master at what he does. What he does is not horror like you would think. It's not magic or the supernatural. It's psychologically demented in many ways. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. It's dangerous. <laughs> it's dangerous. It's threatening. And at the very least, it's disturbing stories by Dennis Etchison. And I've often wondered why he hewed to the East Coast literary establishment's dictum that the art form of the age was realism. Because to me, that was old hat. <coughs> And to Ray Bradbury. But I, grew, but I grew up as a science fiction fan. I love science fiction. Yeah, it isn't a question of wasn't he informed. It's a question of he's an educated man. Don't hold that against him. <laughs> <laughs> he, he is totally educated. He's gone through all their procedures. They have done surgery on his brain. It didn't, it didn't take. And, and the truth of it is, that it did take, that somehow within him there is a set of strictures that tells him he's on the right path if he's not trying to invoke the supernatural. And he gets into the supernatural anyway by clumsiness once in a while. But aside from that, <laughs> let me give you a couple of examples of Dennis Etchison at full cry. One of them is a short story called uh, sitting in the corner, whimpering quietly. <laughs> you wonder what the hell is this about? Well, I'll tell you in brief strokes. He does it to perfection. Every word is just what you want it to be. When it ends, it ends. It's a story in all of its classic formats. Basically, this guy is pissed. The world is in on his case. Nothing is going fucking right. He starts to get something happening and it all falls apart on him, and he doesn't know what the hell, he wishes they would leave him alone. And so this, he takes his dirty clothing in the middle of the night to a quiet laundromat where he can sit and brood and figure out what the hell they got against him. And he's sitting in there, and in comes a woman with some sheets to wash, and she's pissed as hell, and she starts talking to herself, and to the fucking walls, and he can't avoid it. Her goddamn kid had the fucking gun aimed right at her goddamn husband, and she said, pull the fucking trigger, and he did not do it, that asshole little fucking kid. <laughs> didn't have the balls. And on she goes. She's mad at the little kid because he didn't have the balls to do it. That's right. He did not have what it took, for God's sake. Wait, not what she would have expected from him. Because she's, the kid fucking knows what's been going on. And how he's been slapping her around. And how she's had all this goddamn agony. And what a son of a bitch he is. And how quickly she would have pulled that trigger on him. 
and the kid's got the fucking gun, and he's menacing her, and she says, and the goddamn kid won't do it, and she's washing these sheets, and there's blood all over the goddamn sheets, you know, and he's, and our poor hero is just telling you as factually as he can what she's doing, what she's saying, and the effect it's having on him is such that at the end of his story, I may have left some the more he doesn't say a out. word. He doesn't say a word. He leaves. And he goes out thinking, why don't they leave him the fuck alone? <laughs> <laughs> Two thousand words. Great. Powerful, Good. powerful yeah. thing. Breaks your heart. I'll give you another real brief one. Guy and his bride, his wife, his sweetheart are sleeping. Only well, he's not asleep. And she's lying there so beautiful in this dim light. And he takes this belt from his bathrobe, and he dangles it above her, and he starts to drag it very lightly over her skin. And at first she wriggles a bit, and then, then she tries to turn over a little bit, but it just continues to do it. And suddenly she shrieks, screams, she wakes the hell up, and he's there, there, what is it? She says, a dream. Snakes. They were crawling all over me, da 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 how bad it was. There, there, it's just a dream, darling. Go back to sleep. No, they're sweet. No, no, everything's cool. There, there, he strokes her, he touches her. She finally lays back down. She goes to sleep. Out comes the belt. <laughs> <laughs> and you think, oh, God, it's so perfect. It's I, can't I can't take credit for that. That's actually by Robert Sheckley. Is it it's called Fear in the Night. Yeah, oh, I God. love that story. God, Again, I'm a sorry. very short story that's very chilling. I saw it as a Dennis Hedges movie. <laughs> well, God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> I could have just said, yeah, I would have said that. Wasn't he honest and noble? Mm -hmm. He's got honor. The thing is, it, it's very easy to want to take the credit. That's what I work for. Dennis is oblivious to that. We Peter, discussed this. Pete, could I, or could someone get me uh, like some Pepsi, regular Pepsi, and some ice in a cup? That would be so nice because I got a dry mouth. Carry on, George. And, and some heroin if you got it. <laughs> <laughs> we discussed this, Dennis and I, and I'm saying to him, uh, "What do you think is the difference between us?" And it finally came out that I'm a kid of the de depression. And I've never known anything other than some form of want, some deficiency of free money. And Dennis was a very, very pampered child who got everything he needed or wanted. He was not deprived. I was deprived. This puts a clink in my brain that's different than his experience. And also the fact, I think, that he's an educated man, and I'm not. I pride myself on not having a collar, that nobody calls the shots with me except me, that I can change my mind in a minute. Yeah. I'm an absolutely Try that free later man. On with me. He's a wild dog. <laughs> yeah, I am a dog without a collar. George has probably read more books than I have. He, he read his way through libraries growing up, right, in different towns. I he ran, probably read more books than I have. I, read from, I ran from reality, and I read obscure, strange books. Has anybody ever read Milton? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, Milton who? Pro Prometheus, <laughs> Prometheus <laughs> Bound. <laughs> Prometheus Unbound. These are big, fat, thick books. I wanted to be a writer. I loved writing. I loved reading. But I couldn't do what he's doing of war in heaven and, and Lucifer and his decision to challenge Jehovah. And God, it's a fantastical story. Magical to the extreme. Well, he had better but drugs I, than you had. I couldn't get through a problem. I, I tried. I had this very expensive book that somebody had left and it turned into trash, but I would open it and I would read four or five or six pages of it. Totally overwhelmed me. The guy was so lucid and uh, weird, religious. Anyway, I met Ray Bradbury. I not, didn't meet him as a person yet, but I ran across some of his short stories. And they came from all manner of places. They, he put them together in the dark country, or whatever no. it's called. Yours is the dark yeah, country. Yeah, this is called the October country. The October country and dark carnival. Yeah. And dark carnival, yeah. And that sort of place, and I've run across these little short stories. We so were both it. heavily influenced at an early age by the stories of Ray Bradbury. That's another thing so that's is everyone basic I knew. for us. So is everyone I knew. Even uh, Theodore Sturgeon, who preceded Bradbury. But Bradbury. I, 
would explain that he would take Theodore Sturgeon's stories <coughs> apart to try to figure out how they worked. And I met Sturgeon, I got to be really good friends and even a business partner with him. I found the guy absolutely remarkable in his ability to control this rapport that grows between a writer and the reader when the writer takes the reader into his confidence and says things like Hemingway did in the opening story part of his wonderful story about Havana, Cuba. Uh, anyway, the story starts out and he says, you know how it is in Havana in the harbor early in the morning about five o'clock and the garbage people are bringing this out and they're sluicing down the streets. They're preparing for a business and that you know in there makes him your equal. He's now saying, I'm not telling you a lot of new stuff. I, I'm just reminding you how it is. Remember how it was? He's not condescending to the reader. Not one That's, goddamn bit. Yeah. And he, when he, once he's got his arm around your shoulder, he keeps it there. Every once in a while, he reminds you that he knows that you're there by some careful little construction like, well, you know how it is. He's just leading you along to tell his story. And he does it fabulously. I once had an opportunity to introduce him, to try to explain to people where, where Sturgeon was in this hierarchy of really great writers. And I was really totally baffled at doing it because you don't remember his stories. I've got a collection of his called uh, A Touch of Strange. And it is, in it is a story called The Pod and the... Uh, I don't know what the hell is he talking about. I'm not sure what it is that he's saying. And the same thing is true of most of his stories. So he grips you tightly and takes you securely all the way to the end. There's something very unmemorable about his stories to the point where when you talk about Sturgeon, you think about more than human. That's about it. That's Sturgeon, more than human. But the nature, oh, no. the nature of the author and his voice, that's, that's what it. you love. You that's want to it. read anything, a new thing by Sturgeon, if it right. came out. His and it, it doesn't matter what it was about. Me it just It was a question of this intelligence right. talking to you. That's right. That's very and, good. And that's what I felt about Bradbury, too, yeah. was, my God, I don't care what his story is. I just want to hear him sing. I just love the way this guy thinks. Yeah. I just want to hear him sing because there is that about it. He can take a single word and turn it into a paragraph. Da 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 da. Dark. Da 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 da. And that word dark colors everything around it. it just radiates because it's. He knows how to use white space. And that's important when you're reading to relax you, to make you know that you're not really laboring at this, that you're snapping through these pages because there's a lot of white space. It's not densely written where you've got to follow along torturous arguments. Bradbury had a voice. That's what I tried to develop. And I tried to develop it by making my inner voice the same voice I have when I speak. And I did it by the magic of daydreaming. I go out every day, and Paul will tell you it's true, it's true. Nine o'clock. <laughs> nine o'clock in the morning. Thank you, Rob. Paul. Nine o'clock in the morning or something. A cup of coffee, a bowl of dope, um, a, a cola. I'll sit out in my damn a glass cardboard. Glass of wine. A glass of wine. Watch another cola. And a another cup of, coffee. And then a cup another of glass of wine. And and I will watch the street go by. And nothing much happens. Dogs bark. Noise gets increasingly worse in the morning. Then it vanishes a little bit. And I sit there, and what the hell am I doing? I'm talking to myself. It almost becomes audible at times when I'm making some lengthy explanation to some very inquisitive questioner about, like I talked to myself all morning about Dennis. I made up 20 speeches about you, Dennis. They were wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Not like this one at all. <laughs> you, you, you write my funeral service. It'll be, it'll be a good one. Uh -huh. but, let, but you know, may I just interject? I, I really would, I should respect my elders. I don't, I don't want to interrupt George. But uh, there is that quality of talking 
And I guess to yourself, someone once raised the question of who is your ideal reader, who are you writing these things for? Who do for? you talk to when you're talking? But to really, you? I'm writing it for someone who's just like <coughs> me, who knows everything I know, except he's about ten seconds behind me in his thinking, right so on. he doesn't know the next thing I'm going to say. But he'll understand. <laughs> he's, you know. So I guess you could say that's talking to myself. And you're taking, you are talking to somebody who's going to understand and who knows everything you know, and you're not condescending and you're not over-explaining. You're just saying, so, and so you understand, those of you who have tried to write, how hard it is to achieve that when you're writing, because you want to try to make it bookish and literary. You want to try to write the sort of lines that you would read in a book. But that's not the hard, that's, not, that's easy to just try to imitate bookish writing, but it's very boring. And it's, it doesn't leave room for you to come through. So carry on with that, talking to yourself. I like that, talking I to yourself. I absolutely I find myself actually becoming audible. And so because of this... Oh, I talk to myself. And I, I, lis to. I listen to the cadences of what I'm saying inside, because this inside is an expression of the outside. And if I can get this tone of voice in which when I'm talking to myself, it becomes terribly sincere and wonderful and sometimes lyrical and cute. And I make notes of it every day. I, I carry around pieces of paper. I cover them with furious notes with the biggest pencils I can find so that I'll read them. What the hell does this say? Oh, God, he's like Jeff Buckley. <laughs> oh, this is, a, this is a scheme for a book of short stories. It's going to be quite remarkable. It's going to be a book about writing. But it's going to be made up of a flock of stories. And it's called A Penny for Your Thoughts. Because they'll pay you a penny for your thoughts if you write them down. They used to, yeah. <laughs> yeah, write them down, and you sometimes even more than a penny. But I've always adopted that attitude of the fictioneers. That's where I met Ray Bradbury, to be physically know him. Uh, there is this group, club. They call themselves the fictioneers. They've got a secretary, or had, and the secretary would notify you, and every year, they would have a banquet, a meeting, and it was at a place called uh, the Seven Chefs. No, no, that was uh, the Gay de Paris, some uh, uh, cafe on on uh, Sunset Boulevard at the foot of it, and they would have this banquet. So Charles Beaumont was invited as a fictioneer, and he took me along as a guest, and I found myself ultimately in an upstairs room in a French restaurant with a bunch of people, including Robert Block was there, A.E. Van Vogt, Clifford Simic, Paul Anderson, numberless people who in my youth entranced me with their work. And here I am in a room with them, with Charles Beaumont, who sort of got me in. And along the way, there's a guest of honor was Theodore Sturgeon, and really? he spoke for a while about how glorious things were. Was Bradbury there? Hmm? Was Bradbury there? That's where he's going, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and after it was all over, I went downstairs to the bar, which a lot of the people did. Some went home. But a lot went down to the bar below to carry on all this conviviality we'd been having. And I'm at the bar trying to get them to give me a glass of wine. And in comes Ray Bradbury. I don't see him. Suddenly someone is shoving his way in, and there's Ray Bradbury. And I'm standing there, and he's trying to order a drink, and I'm waiting for my drink. And we're both trapped in this awkward little position, almost face to face. And the month before, I had read Icarus Montgolfier Wright. It's a very poetic, uh, mythological story. And I said to Ray, I read Icarus Montgolfier Wright. It's really fabulous. The minute I saw it, I said to myself, it's going to make a great semi-animated cartoon comic, you know? Oh, no, I, no, Bradbury, I really... So I'm talking to him about Icarus. And along the way, standing at the goddamn bar, I tell him I'd love to write a script based upon this story to show how to make a film out of it. Well, God bless us, so what and all. Okay, go ahead, go write it. But, he says, at the end of the day, before you put the cover on your typewriter, when you're doing your own work, then just type out a page. And at the end of 30 days, you'll have 30 pages. And I said, oh, God bless you, Bradbury, for your suggestion. And then I went home that night before I went to bed. I wrote the goddamn script. I had it in the morning. I took it out 
made a copy of it for myself in a Xerox store and mailed the original to Bradbury. I had his address. He got it. He ran it through his typewriter and changed a few things to improve wow. it, put his name on it, and now we had a script. And I gave it to a fellow named Lester Goldsmith, who gave it to a fellow who was an editor, director, writer, uh, fabulous person with his own history, who worked for Format Films, which had just split off from UTA and had taken some of the best people, the people that made Mr. Magoo and Willie the Kid and a bunch of wonderful UPA masterpiece things, was working at Format, and Lester gave it to Format, and the next thing you know, we're having a meeting at Format. And they're agreeing that they would love to produce this film. And along the way, I had my artist friend, Bert Schomburg, and Ray Bradbury had his artist friend, Joe Manieni. He did a lot of covers for, for Ray's book. A lot of interior.